Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, the Ruth W. and A. Morris Williams Director of Author Events. It's rare that we invite a writer twice for the same book, but when I received a note that Congressman Schiff was able to join us in person this time, and with the January 6th hearings and the seizure of documents from Mar-a-Lago, the answer had to be yes. Also, <laughs> Also, he's a mensch, and what a mensch. <laughs> the United States Representative for California's 28th Congressional District and Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Adam Schiff was the lead manager for the first impeachment proceedings against former President Donald Trump. He is a former member. Uh, I should have left room for applause. <laughs> He is a former member of the House Appropriations Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee and served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles from 1987 to 1993 and a California state senator from 96 to 2000. In his number one best-selling book, Midnight in Washington, Schiff reveals an insider's look at our democracy's darkest moment, his own path to becoming one of the former president's most prominent antagonists, and the principles we need to renew and the principles we need to renew and reinvigorate in the struggle against autocracy. He'll be in conversation tonight with the award-winning broadcaster and oft-heard voice of WHYY, Tracy Matisak. It is my brain and heartfelt honor to welcome back Adam Schiff and Tracy Matisak to the Free Library. Shame about you not having any fans in Philadelphia. Uh, no, I uh, <laughs> think I'm going to have to come back. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. It is delightful to see a full house here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. We've missed getting together in person over the last couple of years, and what a great opportunity for all of us to come together and have a great conversation tonight with Congressman Adam Schiff. So thank you all for coming. As you know, we've budgeted some time on the back end for your questions uh, for the Congressman. But in the meantime, Chairman Schiff, welcome back to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the last time I was here, it was only in virtual form, and it's so nice to, to be with you here in person. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, uh, we were talking backstage about how much has happened since the hardcover book came out <laughs> in October. <laughs> No shortage of things to talk about. Um, there's much to talk about in your book, but before we get to that, I do want to talk about some of the more recent developments. First thing that I wanted to mention was that we were talking about how President Biden is coming to Philadelphia Thursday night. It was announced uh, to give a primetime address about protecting our democracy, which is precisely what your book is about. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what that tells us, that the president is going to give a primetime address talking about the need to protect democracy in the United States of America. Well, it, it was, uh, you know, I think one of the terrible epiphanies um, I had during the first year of the Trump presidency when it suddenly dawned on me that for the first time, uh, probably since the Civil War, the predominant threat to our democracy uh, came from within. Uh, and that seems pretty self-evident now, but it was really a shocking thing to imagine uh, after you know, growing up a, in a world in which uh, we conceived of the threats to our country all coming from outside, uh, to realize that we had uh, a leader of one of the parties who was tearing down our democratic institutions and, and posing a real threat to an experiment that, while it was more than two centuries in the making, was still not guaranteed of continued success. Um, and you know, here we find ourselves now, a year and a half after the, the failed insurrection, and we are in a more vulnerable position than we were on January 6th. Uh, they have taken that big lie that caused the violence of that day, and after all, if you can persuade the country that we can't trust elections anymore, that whenever we lose an election, that it's somehow rigged or illegitimate, uh, then what is left but violence? Uh, and, and after that day, they have run with that big lie and used it to usher in a new generation of Jim Crow laws, uh, to go after independent local elections workers and statewide elections officials, anyone who will uh, 
refuse to, to rig the election uh, in their favor should they lose again. Um, and, and so it's not a surprise that the president should decide that he really needs to address this issue in prime time. Uh, given all that we have seen take place, it shouldn't surprise us. And yet, I, 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 I suspect you may be very much the same way I am. I find it astonishing, uh, this contradictory set of emotions on the one hand, um, shocked that we find ourselves here, uh, and at the, other, at the same time, not at all surprised given what's happening. So I'm glad that he has made this uh, such a priority uh, because we are at an inflection point. Uh, and we have to, I think, wake up to the threat uh, and realize that we all have a role to play in, in the preservation of our democracy. I want to talk about the redacted version of the affidavit regarding the uh, search at Mar-a-Lago earlier this month. Um, certainly there are now renewed concerns about potential violations of the Espionage Act, um, obstruction, uh, a host of different things. How much legal jeopardy is the former president in at this point in your view? Well, he should be in a lot of jeopardy. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I can tell you that if any of you um, had boxes of classified documents in your home, um, you would be in more than jeopardy. You'd be in handcuffs by now. Um, and, you know, I should say, because I know there's not a lot of public understanding about what those markings on those documents mean, but when something is stamped top secret SCI, sensitive compartmented information, what that means is that even if you have a top security clearance, even if you've had all the background checks necessary to review top secret materials, unless you are read into that particular compartment, you still can't see them um, because the information is derived, generally because it's derived from such a sensitive either human or technical source that the jeopardizing of that source could cause grave damage to the national security. Uh, and so when I see some of my colleagues on the Intel Committee tying themselves in knots trying to defend the indefensible by saying things like, well, you know, these documents have to be at least a year and a half old, you know, how bad could it be? Um, or, you know, uh, for example, let's say they pertain to Zawahiri, uh, Al-Qaeda's number two after bin Laden, who uh, we just took out. Um, well, we already know he was killed. We know where he was when he was killed, so how bad can it be? Well, it can be really bad um, because if the source of how we knew where he was is revealed, uh, that source might be killed. Uh, if the source is a technical source, uh, that technical source uh, may run dry because our adversary now knows how we got that information. So he should be in very serious jeopardy, uh, not the least of which because there were multiple efforts to correct um, the failure from the beginning. Uh, the Justice Department was remarkably patient. Uh, and by first going to ask, and then going to ask again, uh, and then giving a subpoena, and only when the subpoena wasn't effective and they learned that notwithstanding an affidavit to the contrary, they still had classified information, uh, did they resort to a search. Um, and what I think the Justice Department will need to figure out is, among other things, when it was represented to them that they had turned over all of the classified materials um, represented by a lawyer for the former president, was the lawyer lying or was the client lying or were they both lying? Um, but somebody um, was not telling the truth uh, and, uh, and I, I am impressed that the Justice Department is willing to do what it says, which is follow the law where it leads. Uh, and I, I will say I have been very critical of the pace of their investigation when it pertains to what I believe is the far more serious allegations concerning January 6th. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because you mentioned in the afterword to your book, you kind of expressed disappointment with the Justice Department for not moving fast enough. And I wondered if you were satisfied uh, after the search of Mar-a-Lago and Attorney General Merrick Garland's subsequent statement, or do you feel that they're still not moving fast enough on the January 6th 
side of the equation. I, I still have the same concern. Um, I, I think that Merrick Garland is responding in part uh, to what a terrible Attorney General Bill Barr was uh, and how badly he politicized the Department of Justice. Uh, Bill Barr, like so many people from the Trump administration, is now trying to resurrect his reputation um, <laughs> as a defender of democracy, um, which if he's successful at it will be a hell of a coup. Um, <laughs> because yes, he finally got to a line he wouldn't cross, but he crossed a hell of a lot of lines before he got there. Um, you know, not since Watergate have we seen an attorney general intervene in specific criminal cases um, that were tied to the president, uh, to uh, go easy on Roger Stone, uh, to make the case against Mike Flynn go away completely, um, and to use the Justice Department to go after the president's enemies. Uh, so he was a terrible attorney general. Uh, and. Uh, and I think Garland is trying, properly trying to restore the reputation of the department for independence. And that is laudable. But, but if a desire to avoid even the appearance uh, of uh, partisanship leads to a kind of de facto immunity, then it becomes dangerous and a mistake. Uh, and I can't tell you how unusual it is that the Congress as cumbersome a body as it is, should be so far ahead of the Justice Department in a major investigation. <laughs> After all, um, when we need to enforce our subpoenas, we can't do it ourselves. We have to go to the Justice Department. Uh, and they're only batting 50-50 in their willingness to enforce our subpoenas. I can tell you this, you get a subpoena by the Justice Department to show up before a grand jury, and you don't show up, they're coming after you with a warrant. Um, and, and so when the Justice Department came to us a couple of months ago and said, give us all your files, number one, that's not how it works. <laughs> but number two, my, my response was, why don't you have your own damn files? <laughs> um, you know, why haven't you interviewed all the people we've interviewed? Uh, you know, why is it that in Fulton County, Georgia, this courageous district attorney should be so far out ahead of the Justice Department. Uh, speaking of interviews, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence has indicated that he might consider talking with the January 6th committee. And I wonder um, if you think that he is angling for a subpoena so that it will not appear that he voluntarily came to talk to you all. And, and sort of what's the status of that? Do you anticipate that you will hear from him? Well, I, I hope that we will. Uh, candidly, I don't know uh, whether we will. Um, he plainly has uh, very relevant, indeed even central information he could provide our committee and the country. Um, and he has a story to tell that, that is a story that reflects well on him. So there's a good reason for him to want to tell it. Now, of course, there's reasons politically for him to be concerned about telling the story and alienating uh, the, the base of Trump voters. But, but one point I want to make um, that gets lost when you hear representatives of the vice president say that there are separation of powers issues or that there are privilege issues, and that is this. There may be a separation of powers issue if we were to try to force the vice president to testify. There's no separation of powers issue should he decide it's in the country's issue, uh, interest to testify. Uh, it is purely up to him whether he does it voluntarily. Uh, and, and so uh, I think it's clear what the public interest would have him do. Uh, it is at this point still unclear what he will decide to do. Can you give us a sense of what is next or what we can expect next from the January 6th committee? And I'm also thinking about Liz Cheney and the fact that she lost her most recent election. Does that change the timetable for you all in any way, or do you still anticipate that by year's end your work will be done? Um, what's, what's coming up and where are we going? Um, sure. You know, first of all, let, let me say of Liz Cheney, um, I look forward to the day when I can go back to fighting with Liz Cheney. Um, <laughs> but I... But, but I... Uh, 
I have great, great respect for her and the courage that she has demonstrated. And, and I think at this moment, uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, who are devoted to our democracy need to make common cause. Um, I keep coming back in the book to something that the historian Robert Caro once said in an interview. He said that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. It doesn't always reveal us for our best, but it says a lot about who we are. Um, power has said a lot about who uh, Liz Cheney is. Um, power has said a lot also about who Elise Stefanik is. Uh, when Liz Cheney said, I will not go along with a big lie that eats at the heart of our democracy, Elise Stefanik put up her hand and said, uh, I will. Um, and, of course, she's not alone. Uh, there are, sadly... 100 Elise Stefanik's for every Liz Cheney and 100 Kevin McCarthy's for every Adam Kinzinger. Um, and I, this was the other epiphany I had. Uh, maybe you were way ahead of me on this. But I, I had a lot more respect for the people I was working with on the Republican side of the aisle because I believed that they believed what they were saying. Uh, and it turns out that they either didn't believe it at all or none of it was so important as the position they had or the position they wanted in the future. Uh, in terms of where we go from here with the committee, um, I'm you know, trying to keep expectations at a reasonable level. Uh, we will certainly have a hearing or hearings in the fall uh, on our recommendations about how we protect the country going forward. Uh, we may uh, also have a hearing or hearings of the kind of factual nature of what you've seen already. Our primary responsibility is oversight and reform. Um, and I know what people most want is justice, uh, and that will be ultimately the decision of the Justice Department. I do think that, that a lot of what we've uncovered is obviously deeply pertinent to the department's investigation. And, and if I can, let me just highlight two things that really stand out to me about what we've uncovered. The first is a meeting uh, at the White House where Donald Trump is sitting down with his own top Justice Department officials. And he's going through a litany of bogus claims of fraud. What about dead people voting? Well, there's, there's nothing to that. What about ballot boxes of ballots in Georgia? Um, that's BS. He goes through them, and they're shot down one after another, his own people telling him, there's no there there. We've looked into it. There's nothing to that. And what is his answer? Just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republicans. Uh, now, I was a prosecutor for almost six years. Um, I would have loved for evidence of intent, of knowledge and intent, as strong as that. <laughs> knowledge that the claims that he is making are fraudulent uh, and the intent to go forward anyway. Um, and and one, other, um, one other vignette really stands out to me. This is on January 6th on the Mall. Donald Trump is told by the Secret Service that there's a problem at the metal detectors. It's not the usual problem. Uh, at his rallies, there would be long lines to get through the metal detectors because it's time consuming. No, the problem on January 6th was there were no lines. Um, people wouldn't go through the metal detectors because they were armed and they didn't want their weapons taken away. And his response was, then take down the magnetometers. They're not here to hurt me. Um, now, that to me is very powerful evidence uh, of the president's knowledge that these people were armed, uh, knowledge of the, the, the danger and the propensity for violence, knowledge that that threat was directed at the Capitol, not at himself. Uh, and, and of course, you couple that with what he does for hours at the White House as he's watching this attack unfold, his unwillingness to pick up the phone uh, and call anyone to put a stop to it, uh, even when the, the talking heads on Fox, uh, his friends, his staff are all begging him to do something. Uh, and, and to me, this is some of the most compelling evidence that we've produced. So you've mentioned the word evidence several times, and backstage you and I were talking about this sort of breadcrumb trail of evidence, recorded phone calls, tweets, testimony from witnesses who had firsthand knowledge of 
things that the president said and did. And I think there are so many people in the country who are just asking, what will it take to hold the former president accountable? And I guess the, the other piece of it is that there has been concern expressed not only by the former president's supporters, but also by many of his critics, that if he were to be prosecuted, now we risk increased violence in the country. We, we take all of these risks, plus one administration prosecuting the one before. It's not going to be good for the country. How do you respond to that? I guess I'm asking two things. I'm asking, why is it so difficult to hold the former president accountable in light of the evidence? And then secondly, how do you respond to the concerns that prosecuting him um, could be dangerous for the country? Well, I think part of um, what has been so difficult about holding him accountable uh, begins with the Congress itself. And one of the reasons that uh, I wrote the book is there had been a lot written about what was happening in the Trump White House during those years, but not much written about what was happening under the Capitol Dome. And the reality is Donald Trump could not have gotten away with anything he got away with without all of the enablers uh, in the Congress of the United States. Uh, my takeaway after, after two impeachments and an insurrection, <laughs> if you want the Cliff Notes version of the book, <laughs> is you can have the best written constitution in the world, and I believe we do. Uh, you can have the best written laws uh, meant to constrain the worst impulses of human nature, and I don't know whether we do or not, but we try. And none of it will be enough if, if people's oath of office doesn't mean anything, uh, if they don't give content to that oath with ideas of right and wrong, and if they're fundamentally unwilling to accept the truth. Uh, and... Uh, one of the things that became clear to me during the first impeachment trial is notwithstanding what the senators were saying publicly, they understood he was guilty. They understood he was guilty. And, uh, and it wasn't enough. Uh, and about mid-trial, when it became clear to me that we'd proven him guilty and they knew he was guilty, and you even had some of the Republican senators saying in defense of their decision not to allow witnesses to testify. The House has already proved its case five ways. Do we really need them to prove it six ways? It became clear to me that what we really needed to show the Senate was that not that he was guilty alone, but that he was dangerous. Uh, and to me, what made him most dangerous and what makes him most dangerous still is his basic immorality, um, his basic indecency. Uh, someone that indecent simply cannot be allowed to govern. But, but it turned out that uh, the oath of office didn't mean that much uh, to uh, too many of the senators. And he was not held accountable. And after the failure to hold him accountable for the Russia misconduct, it led directly to worse with Ukraine. Uh, the failure to hold him accountable for the Ukraine misconduct led directly to an insurrection. And so the question becomes, if he's not held accountable for any of that, then where does it lead us? Um, and, and so the, the lack of courage in the Congress is why there's been no accountability. We knew, I think, intuitively that, that courage is contagious, but we learned that so is cowardice. And there was a contagion, and it still is a contagion of cowardice among the GOP leadership in Congress. Now, why is it so difficult to hold him accountable for breaking laws? Uh, and I do think that there is a, a grave concern at the Justice Department that, uh, that we not appear like other developing countries in which whoever loses the election is prosecuted for political reasons. Um, and we're not that country, and we never want to be that country. But that does not mean you give immunity to people who are genuinely breaking the law. Um, and, and so, um, to me, it is far more dangerous to establish uh, the, the idea that as a president you are unindictable, and as a former president you are unprosecutable. Um, 
That is an idea, that is an immunity the founders would have never countenanced. They would have recognized the danger. We should recognize that too. And we should also recognize exactly what Donald Trump and Lindsey Graham are doing. And that is they are signaling if you use the rule of law, if you apply it equally, there will be held to pay. Um, if the Justice Department gives in to that kind of threat, it's the end of our democracy. Uh, so in my view, it is far more dangerous uh, to have a lack of accountability than to have accountability. So you just mentioned the end of our democracy, and we've been talking about the threat that the country is under right now in terms of losing our democracy. And in the book, you write about how during college and after law school, you visited and even worked in some countries that were under autocratic rule. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about how those experiences have informed your approach to the growing threat that we now face here in the United States. They informed it a great deal, and you know, probably among the most uh, relevant experiences I had was in the 1990s when I was with the Justice Department. The wall was coming down uh, in Eastern Europe, and the Attorney General under um, the first President Bush uh, decided to send a senior prosecutor to several Eastern Bloc countries uh, to help with criminal justice reform. And I was lucky enough to be chosen to go to Czechoslovakia. Um, when I arrived, it was Czechoslovakia. When I left, it was the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. The country literally divided while I was there. And when I arrived, uh, I remember speaking to the Chief Justice of the Czechoslovak Supreme Court. Uh, and these, these murmurings I was hearing, because I was posted predominantly in Slovakia, in Bratislava, the capital these murmurings I was hearing about separation. And it was his view that this was never going to happen, that this was merely the Slovaks agitating for more resources, uh, for a bigger share of the federal budget. Uh, but they were gaining too much out of, uh, out of being part of this confederation than they would if they were separate. But what I was seeing in, in Slovakia was the rise of a, of a particular demagogue named Vladimir Mechiar. Um, who was very skillfully using the, the economic turmoil that the country was experiencing to direct people's anger against not just the Czechs, but against the other, against the Hungarians and against the Romani population. Uh, and I watched how potent a force this kind of xenophobic populism was. And a few months later, I was visiting this Chief Justice again, and he told me that the separation now was all but inevitable. It had gone from unthinkable to inevitable in a period of months. Such was the power of this demagoguery. Uh, and I've never forgotten that experience, nor have I forgotten what it looks like. Uh, and what Czechoslovakia was going through then was in moving from communism to capitalism, just an extraordinary uh, economic change uh, in which you would have two people who formerly earned the same income, a baker uh, and an English teacher, suddenly earning enormously disparate amounts. The English teacher, now a translator for business, making five times what the baker was making. The baker not only thought that was uh, immoral and unethical, but it seemed downright criminal. Uh, and Metjar played on this this, uh, this sudden uh, anxiety, economic anxiety. Uh, and similarly, in the present, with these phenomenal changes in the global economy, in which millions of people in America and around the world, uh, through automation and globalization, suddenly have very little job security. Um, working harder than ever, their quality of life still less than that of their parents, and the quality of life for their kids looking to be less than what they enjoy. It is very ripe soil for the rise of the same kind of demagogue. And along comes a man who says, I alone can fix it. Uh, so those experiences certainly shaped my perception of what was happening here and what is happening now in Hungary, what is happening in Poland, 
uh, and many other places around the world. Yeah. You were also on the select committee investigating Benghazi. And in the book, you trace a direct line from that investigation to where we find ourselves today with democracy in peril in the United States. Can you connect those dots for us? Uh, sure. Um, Benghazi uh, was, if not the, the birth, certainly the maturation of the use of conspiracy theory uh, as a potent political weapon. Um, and, you know, we had had, I think, before the advent of the Select Committee on Benghazi, we had five or six bipartisan investigations of Benghazi. Uh, each one of them on a bipartisan basis, shooting down all the conspiracy theories about Hillary interfering with security in Benghazi, supposedly, and Hillary doing this and Hillary doing that, um, and including on the Intelligence Committee, where I was then not the chair ranking member, but I was still a member. Um, we had done our own investigation. Our own chairman issued a report debunking these conspiracy theories. Um, John Boehner did not want to form a select committee on Benghazi, which he considered a waste of time because it had been investigated umpteen times already. Kevin McCarthy, uh, however, agitated to do it because, as he would later admit, it was a great way to tear down Hillary's poll numbers. Mm -hmm. And tragically, it succeeded. And I think Donald Trump watched this, and if he needed any further convincing, saw that a lie, a conspiracy theory, endlessly repeated and endlessly amplified uh, on Fox uh, can do real political harm. Uh, and we have seen nothing but that model now repeated over and over and over again. Uh, you know, I'm often asked about the difference between now and Watergate, and to me one of the most significant differences is that Richard Nixon did not have Fox News. Um, had he had Fox News, he would have never been forced uh, out of office. Um, and I don't know what we do about this problem. Um, you know, it used to be most Americans got their news from three broadcast stations. We had a fairness doctrine. Um, because we could, because the public owned the airwaves. But now most news is delivered via pipeline um, or via social media. Uh, and, uh, and you have people like Rupert Murdoch who, uh, I guess it's just all about the money. And so he will use his most valuable real estate um, to have Tucker Carlson uh, echo Kremlin talking points. Um, I, it, it just seems so incongruous to me that at a time during a war uh, in which democracy and freedom are on the line, in which a lot of American companies, to their great credit, pulled out of Russia at great cost, um, that many of those same companies and others continue to advertise on a network that is propagating the same Kremlin talking points. Um, I don't know what we do about that. Um, but I think that the, the ways we get our information now are among the most difficult and cross-cutting problems that the country faces because we simply don't get it from the same place anymore. I want to shift gears and talk about the primaries. We've all been following them. And of course, the expectation a few months ago was that Democrats were probably going to have a pretty rough time in November. Um, there have been, as you well know, some big legislative wins of late for President Biden and the Democratic Party. There is also an enormous amount of frustration about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And so I'm wondering how you're seeing November shaping up at this point for the Democrats. Much better. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> if we were having this conversation three months ago, it would have been a pretty hard conversation. Um, at that time, the, the generic polling, which is often the best indicator of how the midterms are going, uh, would have shown us, and by generic polling I mean, do you want Democrats or Republicans controlling Congress, without saying which Democrat or which Republican. It was running about six to eight points against Democrats. Now that doesn't seem like much, but what that translates into in this uh, gerrymandered world is about two or three dozen House seats. We have a four seat margin right now. Um, that was then. But a combination of things, uh, beginning 
Uh, and where we saw the, the, the trend and the winds really start to change was with that Dobbs decision overturning Roe. Uh, and I think that the shock of that decision, the danger that it posed to, to women's health all over the country, and even beyond that, the realization that this Republican Party is so extreme. Uh, it, it tore off whatever veneer they might have been and showed the Republican Party for what it is. Um, that was hugely consequential. And at the same time, the Republican Party was revealing itself for where it, what it is uh, ideologically. On the Democratic side, we were, we were chalking up a string of historic legislative successes, uh, including the most significant investment in fighting climate change in our history or anybody else's, <laughs> including getting Medicare, uh, the government to be able to negotiate down drug prices. And of course, contrast that with the, the, the Republican senators fighting, trying to filibuster what? Reducing insulin costs for diabetics. Uh, I mean, how, do you, how can you be a viable political party when you know, you're fighting to the tooth to make sure that diabetics pay more? Um, I don't understand it, but, but <laughs> um, you add to that one of the most significant expansions of healthcare for veterans. You add to that the CHIPS Act, which helps bring manufacturing of critical components back to the United States, makes new investments in science. Um, and this is just recently, you add to that the, the rescue plan, which rescued millions of businesses and jobs uh, that got people vaccinated and saved lives. It has been one of the most productive legislative sessions in a generation. Uh, and I have to say, um, we did that with a four-seat margin and no margin in the Senate. Uh, and I'll tell you, um, there, there's no one who could have done that other than Nancy Pelosi. Um, <laughs> so those two things, the, the, the utter radical nature of the Republican agenda, uh, and Democrats showing not only what they're for, but actually producing uh, has meant that we saw the Republican lead in the generic decline over the last three months. The Democratic numbers go up to the point where they have now crossed. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Like any poll, what you're viewing, and I represent Hollywood so I often think in film metaphors, <laughs> what you're seeing is one slide, one frame taken out of the film. We still don't know how the movie ends. Uh, we don't know whether this trend will continue. If it continues, we will hold the House and we will gain enough ground in the Senate where we can do away with the filibuster and then you will see how much more we can do. But at this, at this point, we don't know whether that trend will continue. Um, but what we have to do is we have to prepare as if it will. We have to be ready to win in November. If we don't take the steps now necessary to win, then it doesn't matter where those lines are. Um, we won't be successful. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we haven't spent that much time on in the January 6th committee is the line of effort to overturn the election that ran right through the House of Representatives, uh, in which had Kevin McCarthy had a few more votes, he would have overturned the election. Someone that irresponsible, someone with that little regard for their, their constitutional duty cannot be allowed to govern. Uh, and so it is not an exaggeration, not an exaggeration as you may hear the president say uh, here locally in a few days, uh, to say that, that our democracy is on the ballot. Um, and, and what you do here in Pennsylvania, because of the number of House races you have and because of the Senate race you have, may very well decide everything. And, and in that regard, let me just extend to you a profound thank you from the rest of the country <laughs> for giving us one of the most awesomely funny <laughs> Senate races I've ever seen. <laughs> I, I, 
I, I, think, I think people are going to be studying Fetterman's campaign for years to come um, and, and wondering how crudities cost somebody their election because uh, it's been brilliant. It is brilliant. <laughs> we didn't know we had a Wegners in Pennsylvania. No one knew that. <laughs> So, Congressman, uh, it is time for us to go to the audience for questions, and we've got some staff members with microphones, but quickly, and I always save the toughest question for last, so are you ready? Sunday, December 8th, 2022, Rams, Raiders, at SoFi Stadium, who you got? Well, um, <laughs> I'm being asked this question because I'm a Raiders fan, so of course it's going to be the Raiders. But uh, I know that's probably the wrong answer here. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have stuck with the Raiders through thick and thin. And, uh, and I'm originally from Boston, and I've stuck with the Red Sox through thick and thin. Um, so I, I will tell you one very quick story. My district is close to Dodger Stadium. So I should be a Dodger fan. And I do like the Dodgers, and I support the Dodgers, but I'm from Boston. Um, and my staff finally persuaded me one year to wear a Dodger shirt uh, in one of the parades in my district. And in the same way that you suddenly discover when you buy a car that everybody else on the road has your car, um, I looked over and everybody on the sidelines was wearing Dodger stuff, which I'd never really noticed before. Uh, and they were applauding me with, a, with an extra vigor. Um, and I got to the very end of the parade where someone yelled out to me, who was decked out head to toe in Dodger gear, are you really a Dodger fan? <laughs> This was a true test of conscience. <laughs> so I said, yes, the Dodgers are number two. <laughs> <laughs> and he booed me. <laughs> I wonder how we're going to find out what Donald Trump was planning to do or has done with the material, uh, with the documents in his, at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, you know, it's a very good question. Um, I, I presume the Department of Justice is spending a lot of time focused on exactly that question. Um, I had my own theory, which if the New York Times is correct, then I'm wrong, and I think they're probably correct. Um, my theory was, and you might remember, um, right before one of the last presidential, maybe the last presidential debate, um, Donald Trump's hand-picked and horrible director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, declassified information so Donald Trump could use it in the debate. Um, that was such a shocking thing for anyone in the intelligence community, particularly because, again, it risked revealing a source for that political stunt. Um, and so my speculation, based on what they were doing then and some of the things that Cash Patel, who is sort of like an evil zealot in the Trump administration, um, <laughs> has said about, uh, about some of these documents pertaining to Russia was Donald Trump grabbed a bunch of classified materials that he thought might be useful to him pertaining to Russia. Uh, but the New York Times has reported that the documents actually cover a broad uh, array of topics pertaining to national security. So while that may or may not be true of some, it's apparently not true of all of them. Uh, one of the things that, that I find particularly striking uh, about what has been reported in that affidavit is that these classified documents, they weren't even in folders. They were like pages, uh, you know, interspersed with newspaper clips and other, other detritus, uh, which shows you how much care was being given to these documents. Um, so I have no idea what the hell he was doing. Um, I'm sure the department wants to figure it out. Some of the statutes that they're looking at probably don't require them to prove that this was the, the malicious motivation, um, but they, they uh, will require some level of knowledge on his part. Uh, and the reason why I don't know whether we'll find out is because the Department of Justice, uh, unless they go to trial, um, isn't going to share with the country what, what they're learning from the grand jury or during their investigation. Uh, and mar a was really not the focus of our investigation in Congress. Um, so I'm deeply interested, and I asked for a damage assessment to be done by the intelligence community, and they're doing it, to figure out how much harm, how much risk to humans or, or technical sources we may have uh, incurred 
uh, but, but I don't know when or even if we'll ultimately get the answer to that question. Donald Trump's attempt to, attempt to pull the United States out of NATO, is there a suspicion that that might have been an attempt to grease the skids for Russia to just totally annihilate Ukraine without the United States being a part of NATO? Or there, have there been any, any thoughts around that? Um, you know, Trump's at attacks on NATO and his attacks uh, more broadly on our democratic allies. Um, you know, if I had to, to try to understand where they come from, uh, I would say they come, you know, less um, with a specific plan like that and more with his just general affil affinity for fellow despots. Uh, a kind of envy of the, the dictatorial reign that Putin has uh, and that President Xi has. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talked openly about how, you know, President Xi is extending his term and isn't that brilliant and maybe I should do that. And, um, and, and one of the things that, that stands out, there are so many with Trump and Russia. Sometimes the kompromat, as the Russians would call it, is just obvious and out in the open. And you kind of miss it because it's so damn obvious. Um, when, when Donald Trump was running for president, he was telling the country that he has no business dealings with Russia. Remember that? Um, well, that was a lie. Uh, in fact, he was trying to consummate the most lucrative deal of his life, a Moscow Trump Tower, which would not, have, not only have towered over Moscow, but would have been the tallest building in Russia, indeed the tallest building in all of Europe. Uh, and as Mueller found in his investigation, it would have earned him more than any other real estate deal before. Hundreds of millions, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, now, he kept that lie concealed for a long time. Uh, right up to the Republican convention, in fact, Michael Cohen, his lawyer at the time, was literally on the phone to the Kremlin. Literally on the phone trying to get the Kremlin's support for this project, which they knew wouldn't happen without Putin's blessing. So flash forward almost a year later, Trump is now the president of the United States. It is now discovered much after the fact that he had been lying to the country. And he is confronted uh, on the White House grounds while waiting to get on Marine One, the helicopter, his hair unnaturally unmoved by the rotors. Um, <laughs> And he's asked about this. He's asked about this. Hey, what about that, Mr. President? You said you had no business dealings with Russia. Now we learn that you were actually trying to do this business deal right up to the Republican Convention. Now, for a guy that lies all the time, there are still times when he is very transparent, um, generally because he doesn't understand just how incriminating it is what he's about to say. And in this case, what he says is, I might have lost the election. Why should I miss out on those opportunities? So the answer is basically, yes, I was lying to the country. I'd be a fool to tell the country the truth. I might have lost. Why should I miss out on that deal? That tells you all you need to know about how much he gives a rat's ass about the country. But, but it also tells you all you need to know about a large part of his motivation. As president, I'm sure he still wanted to build that tower. Uh, as president, he probably worried that he might not be reelected. I'm sure he thought to himself he'd be a damn fool to criticize the one guy who holds the key to the most lucrative deal of his life. Um, and it may not be any more complicated than that. There's never been a more powerful motivator for Donald Trump than greed, except maybe vanity. Um, I think I remember Mitch McConnell saying that he didn't want to vote for impeachment because the courts really could take care of that. If the courts don't take care of that, and if we do hold the House and uh, add to the Senate, would the third time be the charm? <laughs> um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the comment about hope. Uh, and I would like to reserve at the end of our evening um, the opportunity to make a comment about why we should be hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in terms of what Mitch McConnell said then, um, there were a number of canaries in the coal mine to our present predicament. Uh, one of them was in 2016 when a Democrat was elected governor in North Carolina. The Republicans in North Carolina responded not by saying we'll do better next time, not by saying maybe we need some new ideas or maybe we need a better message. They responded by stripping the governor of his duties. That told us or should have that something was changing in the Republican Party. That, that was an end to a compact that we'd always had, that when you lose, you accept the loss, and you vow to do better next time. When Mitch McConnell withheld even a hearing from Merrick Garland, um, it was a decision by someone who had previously been considered an institutionalist, that institutions be damned. Uh, if this helps me attain power or hold power, that's all that really matters anymore. Um, now, Mitch McConnell, flash forward to the second impeachment, delays the beginning of the trial until Donald Trump is out of office, and then says, we can't impeach him because he's out of office. Uh, and, you know, I have to say, Mitch McConnell is in a completely different category than Kevin McCarthy. You know, Kevin McCarthy is just craven from head to toe, and, and he makes no bones about it. I think people expected more of Mitch McConnell, um, who knows exactly what he's doing. And, uh, and, and to say, as he did after voting to acquit, that Donald Trump was responsible for the attack that day because he used the biggest megaphone to broadcast the biggest lies, and all because he couldn't accept the result of election, an election. Um, but the unwillingness to do anything about it has meant that he has forced the country to suffer through what we're going through now. Uh, Speaker Pelosi likes to say to our caucus, know your own power. This is true of members of Congress and the Senate. It is true for everyone. Um, and I think had, had McConnell stood up, had more of the leadership stood up, uh, we could have turned the corner. But they didn't. Uh, and, and that failure of will and that, that failure of courage uh, has meant that the country has to go through this for years more. Uh, and I do think, you know, getting back to the question of why it's been so hard to hold him accountable and what the Justice Department may or may not do, um, we should operate under the expectation that the only way we're going to be rid of Donald Trump is by defeating him at the polls again. Uh, and that only when the Republican Party leadership understands that he is an albatross around their necks will they get rid of him. They won't do it for the benefit of the country, but they will do it for their own self-interest. So we have to make it in their self-interest. And one way to make it in their self-interest is we beat them in the midterms, we hold the House, we gain ground in the Senate, so they come to the conclusion we can't win with this loser. Um, and, and then, I think, when he no longer is politically relevant, um, then I think there is a much greater chance that he's held accountable. Uh, we could go on and on. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but Congressman, I do want to give you a moment to talk about hope and why in the midst of everything that's going on, we should remain hopeful. Um, thank you uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this. Um, you know, tonight I've talked about a lot of the, the disappointments that I serve with uh, and the, the failures of courage. In the book, I write about a lot of the heroes, uh, the Marie Ivanoviches, the Alexander Vindmans, the Bill Taylors, uh, and many others who have stood up to this president. Uh, you've seen others uh, more recently, like Cassidy Hutchinson, um, like uh, Gabe Sterling, like Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. Um, they should give us hope. And, and I think that uh, notwithstanding the difficulty of our present, present circumstances, and, and really because of them, We've also seen some of the finest people step forward to run for office on the Democratic ticket that I've ever met. The class of 2018 
including a lot who are veterans of the State Department and the Armed Forces of the Intelligence Community. They, they represent the best class of new members I think Congress has ever had. Uh, the Mary Gay Scanlons, the Susan Wilds, the Alyssa Slotkins, the Abigail Spanbergers, the Elaine Lurias, the Tom Malinowskis, the Andy Kims, they're, the Mike Levins. They, they're, and I could go on, they're all incredible. Incredible, and they're the future of the party. So I look at them and I think the future is bright because of the people stepping forward. Uh, a lot of them who, you know, like those who joined the service after 9-11 to defend the country, decided they need to serve again. Um, we're going to get through this. I think when you're in crisis, it's hard to see how it ends, and sometimes it's hard to see even if it will end. But this too shall pass. We are a very resilient country. We've got millions and millions of wonderful, generous, big-hearted, patriotic people living in every state in the Union who will see us through this. There will come a time, I promise you, when the country looks back on this period and says, how in hell did that guy ever become president? <laughs> um, but, I, but, but what we do in this moment will determine how quickly we get there. Um, and so I, I thank you for your interest in the book. I thank you for coming out tonight. I hope you'll come by with a copy I can sign and say hello. Um, and, uh, and I just uh, want to assure you that, that this too shall pass. Mm. Congressman Schiff, thank you so much. <laughs>